Welcome to Women of Impact in Anesthesiology. I'd like to introduce today Dr. Alice Coombs, Professor and Chair of the Department of Anesthesiology at Virginia Commonwealth University. Thank you for joining me today. For those of us who may not know you very well, can you please give me a brief summary about yourself? Thank you. Uh, well, I came into the field of anesthesiology in an indirect way, but I'm here. Um, I was uh, initially interested in internal medicine. I've always been interested in anesthesia, but when I first tried to uh, pursue anesthesia in medical school at UCLA, my advisor told me that um, the field of anesthesia was for people who couldn't get into other residencies and were from outside the United States. They trained outside the United States. So he said it was a quote unquote low esteem profession. That was back in the late seventies. And uh, I even wanted to go into anesthesia back then so much so that I did a preceptorship in anesthesiology. Mm -hmm. um, but because of the discouragement, I actually went into internal medicine, which I liked as well. And I um, matched at Mass General Hospital in internal medicine. And I loved internal medicine. Um, but after completing internal medicine, I really still wanted to go into anesthesia. And uh, I applied for the anesthesia residency after being in private practice for a year mm -hmm. and a few months mm -hmm. and uh, went back into uh, residency at Mass General in anesthesiology, uh, after which I, I absolutely loved anesthesia. And I uh, did a critical care medicine fellowship at Mass General as well. And then I followed with a cardiac uh, cardiothoracic um, anesthesia fellowship at Tufts University, where I stayed on staff and I was uh, one of the uh, directors of the surgical intensive care unit. My uh, background is from Compton, California. I grew up uh, in a area that was pretty rough. Um, I went to UCLA and uh, I uh, wanted to be a doctor because I saw healthcare disparities in my neighborhood and I wanted to make a difference in people's outcomes. Thank you for your story. It's really unique and um, a great inspiration for all of us. As a chair of an anesthesia department, you have to guide a lot of your mentor, guide and mentor your faculty. Um, any advice you can give to fellow anesthesiologists who believe their career is stagnant? I, I'm gonna recommend um, a couple of books. Yeah, uh, one. I would recommend uh, Think Again by Adam Grant. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would also recommend uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. I have a, several other books I would recommend. So the advice I would give to uh, mentoring faculty, which I have often, is to really be able to recreate yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't let your identity be stagnant and allow yourself to transform based on what your perception is in terms of whether or not you feel like you're meeting your, your passionate goals that you, things that make you excited, things that make you get up and wanna go to work. Um, there is a recipe that I give trainees and anyone who applies to this program has heard this before. <laughs> These are the Coombs three circles, okay? <laughs> And one of the things I um, uh, help people to decide whether or not they should go to a certain place or they should pursue a certain avenue of discipline. And one circle is whether or not the place or the thing that you're doing is going to be nurturing. Does it bring out the best you? Does it allow you to be your authentic self? Mm -hmm. So that's the circle over here. I'll call it nurturing. Does the environment do that? does the discipline you're pursuing, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's one circle. The next circle is, does it, this thing allow you to develop skill set? Does this take you to the next level? Mm -hmm. uh, does this allow you to do things by the sheer fact that certain things are available in that environment that allows you to develop that skill set? Mm -hmm. And that could be a myriad of things. Mm -hmm. The third circle, which is really huge, is the brand. So what kind of brand 
does what you're going to do have, where you're going to go, what kind of brand does an institution have? With that, inculcated in that brand and that circle is what kind of brand do I bring and what kind of brand do I take away? And so um, those are the three circles. And in the center, when it overlaps, is your sweet spot between nurturing, skill set, and brand. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's one of the things that I recommend constantly for people who are trying to decide. And mm -hmm. you, you'll notice that inculcated in that is not what someone feels on the outside. It's not what your counselor is recommending. It really has to do with you coming into uh, it, the perception of what you really need and mm -hmm. what, what's really good for you. Mm -hmm. It's very different. I think for people to have an internal barometer is essential. Will you just slow down enough to think? You have to really be intentional with this, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, this whole notion of you only get one time to go around on the merry-go-round. Right. Mm -hmm. And I often tell people who are younger, you know, people who are applying to residency is that I'm jealous. You get to go around on this merry-go-round at the very beginning. And you get to choose differently. Mm -hmm. I like, I like your three cum circle. <laughs> <laughs> What is the best career advice you have received from a mentor? Uh, one thing that um, Dr. Joe Heyman uh, said to me, allow people in the room to speak first, share their ideas. Don't come in as a leader telling people what you believe first, already you've anchored and you just about shut down the discussion, you've killed innovation, and the rest is history. Mm -hmm. People in the room will anchor on what you said and say, if I say anything, you know what? It will be like going against right. the pilot. Yeah. I'm going against the commander. Yeah. I'm the first officer. Am I going to speak against the first? You know, no. no. Mm -hmm. It's the whole concept of outliers. Mm -hmm. So it really does matter that you allow people in the room to speak first mm -hmm. listen and that is so hard mm -hmm. it's an active event though mm -hmm. you know and sometimes you have to keep this little guy in the cage and <laughs> bloody your tongue <laughs> and the amazing thing is more than likely when you listen to people's ideas you can understand them better and actually the thing that you thought that you really wanted to do, it may change your mind about, yeah, you may still do that, but it may change your mind about how you do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I really do believe for uh, people that I mentor, I believe that one thing that we neglect is the wisdom of the crowds. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, I would recommend that book too, The Wisdom of the Crowd by James Sirickey, <laughs> um, another book. But uh, understanding uh, what happens when you're either advocating for something or negotiating, understanding what happens with the wisdom of the crowd is allowing yourself to learn from others, but also understanding that where there is diversity in a room, that is going to yield the best solution. Mm -hmm. When I see all gray haired men at the table making a, uh, making a decision about what the community needs and you have, you know, Chinese, Laotians, African-Americans, Latinos, and none of them are at the boardroom, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Whether it's at the boardroom of a healthcare system or the ASA, mm -hmm. because you have neglected to really understand what's going on in the community because you've eliminated those people at the community, the people who would actually yield uh, a different idea, a different advice. And, and I'll say it the way Jonathan Kahneman has said, um, actually it's Joseph Stiglitz who said, uh, one thing that's really important is when you don't have diversity in education, you don't have diversity in corporations, you look at people who are making decisions and when you eliminate diversity at the governance level, 
guess what you just did? You eliminate the brilliance that comes with the groups that should be represented at the table. There's a Gaussian curve of brilliance. And you eliminate the brilliance that comes from the different groups that you've eliminated. And what you have is just the Gaussian curve with the distribution of one set in making the decision. And so that's that's the real, that's a real, real important matter of having diversity. People think it's, the, well, you know, diversity really matters because it allows you to relate to patients. That's true. But the other piece of it is that there's brilliance that comes with every group. Mm -hmm. You have to accept that. There's mm -hmm. a Gaussian curve of brilliance. And when you don't have diversity at the table, you actually eliminate the brilliance that would have come with each of the groups that you've eliminated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really uh, important to highlight. And I, I thank you for bringing that up because a lot of people say what you mentioned, that you need diversity for patient care, but it's really the idea is because we all come from different experiences and we have different experience and different knowledge. How has networking helped you, um, has helped you in your career? And what advice would you give to mm -hmm. anesthesiologists on the importance of networking? I think networking is uh, really important to gain social capital. Mm -hmm. uh, one example I'll give you is uh, I was speaking with uh, a colleague who was doing a doctor's back to school program where we go into the school and we talk to the kids about going into medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, he mentioned that he went to a Nobel laureate dinner and he said that uh, he had an opportunity to go around to different individuals who won Nobel Prizes. And he decided that he would ask them one key question. And he said that he decided to ask them, what do you, what do you think was the most important thing that contributed to your winning the Nobel Prize? And he said he found one consistent thing amongst each one of them. He said that he would ask them this question and their response was, I actually started looking at another discipline, something totally different from what I was studying. And then understanding the concepts and this other discipline, I came back, it wasn't really planned, but applied something that I learned from doing this other thing. Mm -hmm. And this is nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. And so part of innovation is taking a working, a thought, a, a way of doing something in another total area and mm -hmm. applying it to your area. Mm -hmm. That is kind of like what Clayton Christensen describes as disruptive innovation. Mm -hmm. It's like, how can you do more, be more efficient without going through the same way as you have traditionally mm -hmm performed. Mm -hmm. For instance, I went to Africa for several years to Ghana uh, with the Foundation for African Relief. And several times we went there, we tried to reincarnate the system here. Uh, you see the doctor first, uh, you know, um, then you get your labs, come back for your diagnosis, then you get your prescription. Uh, after about the third trip, <laughs> We flipped the switch. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked to the patients up front and said, we're going to do a series of tests on you. We explained to them HIV, hepatitis. Um, and they would get their HIV test, hepatitis, blood sugar, get their blood pressure measured. And then we rerouted them. Mm -hmm. So then we would begin to triage them based on whether or not they had a swab positive for HIV, and they would go directly to uh, the HIV section. Mm -hmm. And and it was it was amazing. We were able to see five to 600 patients a day, and we only had eight doctors. Mm -hmm. Eight doctors. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But we didn't have to do a lot of no <laughs> documentation. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and and the and the prescriptions was like on a pad. <laughs> 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 but uh, that was an example of disruptive innovation. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that a recommendation and something that I would recommend for uh, my fellow colleagues would be learn from other discipline. Mm -hmm. there is, there's so much to be gleaned from studying other disciplines, taking that information and saying, what can I inculcate in what I do every day and make it better. Mm -hmm. And that, that, if they want to be a good leader, the definition of leadership, I'm giving you the Harvard Kennedy definition by Dean Williams, is the ability for an individual to actually move a community or a group of people mm -hmm. to an action that results in the betterment of a community. That's the definition of leadership. And the key is the betterment. You can be a leader in someone else's eyes, but true leadership means it's for the betterment of a community. Correct. I like that definition. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. <laughs> Not mine. <laughs> and thank you for sharing all your experiences. Uh, I've learned a lot from you today, and I'm sure others <laughs> 